Hey, tailgaters! Ross of the Pigskin Tales Podcast here. Feel that summer heat? It's not just the sun, it's the thrill of upcoming college football season, stoking the coals. So get ready for the season, dive into the history books with Homefield, the premium collegiate apparel brand from Indianapolis. Homefield crafts incredibly comfortable gear designed with iconic vintage nods over 150 colleges. A library of history right on your chest. Homefield is the Indiana Jones of collegiate apparel, uncovering hidden gems from school archives. Unique mascots, logos, and even unforgettable moments frozen in time. Visit homefieldapparel.com and shop the archives. Homefield Apparel, where comfort, nostalgia, and the spirit of college football history unite. Again, that's homefieldapparel.com. If you're a regular listener, you heard on New Jersey Dispatch last week that our friend Joe Ziemba told us about his baseball and some other collectibles that he has. Well, today he shares some of his Chicago Cardinals, the pride and joy of his collection that he shares with us on his great football history coming up in just a moment. This is the Pigskin Daily History Dispatch, a podcast that covers the anniversaries of American football events throughout history on a day-to-day basis. Your host, Darren Hayes, is podcasting from America's North Shore to bring you the memories of the gridiron one day at a time. So as we come out of the tunnel of the Sports History Network, let's take the field and go no huddle through the portal of positive gridiron history with pigskindispatch.com. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hello, my football friends. This is Darren Hayes of PigskinDispatch.com. Welcome once again to the Pig Pen, your portal to positive football history. And boy, do we have a treat today. We're going to be talking about some collectibles and a collector that has some vintage items that have some great history to them that uh, tell a story of the game. And one of the best storytellers I know, not that he's telling stories, but... He's telling stories that are interesting. Joe Ziemba, our friend from When Football is Football podcast and multiple books and appearing everywhere near you, uh, talking uh, about some great Cardinals football. Uh, Joe, welcome back to the pig pen. Oh, Darren, thanks so much. Always a pleasure to be with you. And uh, I love your insightful questions and your attempts to make me look like I don't know what I'm talking about, which isn't difficult. But uh, (laughs) pro football history. Oh, we're on the same page here. Thank you. I think that's totally impossible because uh, you know quite a bit, a lot more than uh, most of us do, including this this guy talking to you. <laughs> and uh, you know, I'm I'm glad that we could get you away from your your world tour of uh, you know t- spreading the Cardinals history. And uh, it must be the off day for you. You know, I love Cardinals history, and if anyone listening would love to be bored by it, I'll, I'll come talk, and uh, just a, a lot of fun. And then tonight we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the things that got me going on that. Yeah. And I guess maybe this is a, a good time. Let me put in a shameless plug for the PFRA. Uh, Joe is going to be one of the guest speakers at our, I guess you, we call it the biannual convention, which will be in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania this year. Uh, we have you know some great speakers, in, including Joe and some other PFRA members and some former players from the National Football League and some some other professional leagues as well. So it's a, a great time. Uh, on the front page of pigskindispatch.com, we have the little Pennsylvania emblem as the PFRA 2023 in it. You can click that, get some more information, get signed up to come to the convention. And we also have a way to join the PFRA. There's the PFRA logo on the other banner. Uh, Make sure you do that. It's a great organization and Joe and I are both members of. So Joe, you have uh, some collectibles here uh, of the Cardinals. Um, and I believe all of them are, are Cardinals related. I guess there's some Bears related too. Mm-hmm. We'll say Chicago football. And uh, one of them that really sticks out in the photos that you sent is uh, looks like a, a bobblehead of some sort of, of a player. And uh, maybe you could tell us a little tale on that, maybe how you got it, who it represents, and uh, with anybody, and be interested to yeah. hear it. Well, my uh, my – interests lie in Chicago pro football and predominantly the old Chicago Cardinals, which were around from 1899 to 1960 when they shunned us and left for St. Louis and of course now in Arizona. But I've been picking up things over the years that are Chicago Cardinals related, whether they be matchbook covers 
autographed index cards, photos, et cetera. But you still look for things that are historically interesting as well as maybe visually appealing if you want to display them. And one of those was this little bobblehead, which I've never seen another like it. And maybe going back 15 years or so, I was at one of the sports shows in Chicago and and saw this guy and uh, asked about it if it was for sale. And I thought he would be saying, yeah, it is. Here's what it is, several hundred dollars. But it wasn't. It was, uh, I think, $40 or something. And I looked at it and then just to verify, I asked, is this uh, Chicago Cardinals, Louisville Cardinals, Illinois State Cardinals or whatever? And he said, no, no, Chicago Cardinals. And this cute little guy was there and... Uh, in working condition with his with his head moving. So I decided to get it and really didn't know if it had any value or not. And it probably doesn't. Although when I do do uh, some speaking programs, I bring displays to them. And this guy has been with me at several of the programs. And, and just a couple of months ago, someone told me, said, oh, you know, I'm a collector and I've not seen one like that from the 50s. And that's worth something. So I don't know if it is or not. Well, my greatest fear for him is when uh, a little nephew came over who was about two and a half years old, and he saw the bobblehead and wanted to see it. And as everyone in the room cringed, he grabbed the top of it. And he was, looked like he was going to slowly turn it until someone said, hey, who wants some candy bars or something? Oh, he was gone. But uh, <laughs> now I keep it kind of up above Uh pets and little guys and uh, he survived the last many years though in the household so yeah it's a, a really nice thing to have don't know its value don't know if it's of any interest but a bobblehead before bobbleheads became popular is what intrigued me yeah, well i got a piece of advice to you with bobbleheads I, i've got a couple bobbleheads myself don't ever use it to answer your wife uh, to a question that she answers if you're busy, you know, doing a podcast or reading, uh, you know, something, you're watching television, and she asks you a yes or no question, and you make the head uh, say your answer. They <laughs> Wives don't like that very much, so it's just, a, right. I highly uh, recommend don't doing that <laughs> from experience. Good advice. Thank you. <laughs> Now, you also sent some some images uh, from your collection. Uh, you have uh, three different uh, photos that you've sent that uh, really look some great, some great black and whites, uh, very clear and vivid of some former players uh, that played in the Chicago area. And boy, we'd love to hear about them. This is uh, probably my favorite project. Once I had eased off of writing that first book about the Cardinals and uh, kept looking for history about his, historical important figures in Chicago pro football history. And I wanted to get a, something I could display in my own office with a, a photo from the time, as well as a signature autograph from that player. And they're hard to match up, but so normally I would do one or the other. It's almost like asking a songwriter, do you write the words or the, or the music first? And for me, it was, do I buy the autograph or the photo first? So if I saw one that looked interesting, normally I'd get the autograph uh, first. And one of those that we're talking about is John Patty Driscoll, who was a star with the Cardinals in the 20s. He was the NFL's highest paid player at $300 a game. And back then in the early 20s, players were still getting $10 or $25 uh, and whatever they could maybe get from the fans donating to the, to the game. But uh, having found his autograph, I went searching for a photo and was able to find a, a decent photo and match them up. And then I found a, uh, a guy in the area. I wanted them to be consistent, the same background, the same frames, not that I'm artistic, but to maybe make them look like uh, they belong together, put the same paper on the same frames. And so I followed up my next project was Bronco Nagurski and Red Grange, two of the best names in pro football history and both for the Chicago Bears. And I found the autograph of Grange rather easily. He signed quite a bit. Uh, Nagurski was a little tougher to find. And again, I wanted a looking on, say, if it's an index card or a piece of paper that could be used without damaging the surface and framed and matted. That's what I was looking for. 
And so I found uh, signatures of both Grange and Nagurski, and then a cool photo of both of them in the same photo with Nagurski blocking for Grange in the late 20s for the Chicago, or excuse me, that'd be the early 30s when Nagurski played with the Bears. So uh, put that together. And of course, they're both household names in Chicago. Grange saved pro football in 1925 when he joined the Bears immediately after the last game of the University of Illinois football season. They played Ohio State on a Saturday and Sunday. He signed with the Bears, and a week later, he was uh, playing against the Cardinals at Wrigley Field in front of a sold-out crowd. And of course, that led to the Red Grange tour, as you know, Darren, where we had going from 1,500 people attending a pro game to 70,000 in New York. So always nice to have those guys up there. And of course, Nagurski, uh, just a, a strong player. You've heard the stories about him running into the wall at Wrigley Field, which was right in the end zone. And Nagursi ran with his head down and went through two tacklers and then hit the wall head on, bounced back. He's a little groggy, and George Hallis went up to Bronco and said, Bronco, Bronco, are you okay? He said, sure, coach. Those first two guys were nothing. But that third guy, he really packed a wallop. <laughs> so that's my favorite Nagurski story. And I would recommend a new book by uh, Chris Willis of NFL Films on Bronco Nagurski, which, uh, of course, he also wrote one on Red Grange. So uh, he was uh, kind enough to let me uh, do some research for him on those books. But they're both excellent books uh, on two of the pioneers of pro football from the, the early days, of course. There's other ones I was able to, to put together. Um, I have photos of George Hallis the longtime owner of the Bears, and Jimmy Councilman of the Cardinals. But probably my uh, favorite one um, is Ernie Nevers. Uh, should I talk about that one, Darren? Yeah, yeah, please do. Please do. And Ernie Nevers uh, played for the Duluth Eskimos. Yes, there was a team called the Duluth Eskimos, played primarily in a way schedule during the 1920s. He was an All-American at Stanford played his first pro game, ironically, against uh, as a member of the All-Star team in Jacksonville, Florida, I think, in January of 1926. And then he went over and played some pro baseball for the St. Louis Browns before playing for Duluth and finally coming over to the Chicago Cardinals. But in 1929 against the Bears, the Cardinals defeated the Bears 40-6. to And they were bitter rivals then. But Nevers, behind the blocking of Hall of Famer Duke Slater, scored all 40 points for the Bears. And that mark has never been equaled. So from 1929, that's still the most points ever scored by an individual in an NFL game. His six touchdowns have been du duplicated, like by Gail Sayers was, was one and 66. But Nevers also kicked the extra points. And though he wasn't completely accurate, he added four extra points that day for his 40, 40 points total. And then over the years, I was found this note that he wrote uh, saying that his biggest thrill in pro football was scoring those 40 points against the Bears. And I had to have it. That one cost a few bucks. Uh, <laughs> had to have it. Matched it up with a photo of him to match the others. And so that, too, uh, sits proudly in my office. Uh, that's the story of Ernie Nevers, uh, Hall of Famer, of course, and one of my all-time favorite players. <laughs> yeah, and and folks, uh, a lot of these images that uh, and items that uh, Joe is talking about, he sent us uh, photos of, and we, we're posting them on Pigskin Dispatch on the subsequent uh, post that we have that, that goes with this. You can go to the show notes and link right up to Pigskin Dispatch and see uh, pieces of Joe's collection that he speaks of. Now, you have uh, some really intriguing uh, the last two items here, and they're documentations, and I. I would love to talk about the first one that, uh, you know, it's, it's got sort of a red ribbon going across it and looks very official and uh, very prominent. And uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about that because it's got something to do with some Chicago football history. Yes. Well, the Cardinals history, I found out to be pretty murky. Uh, for example, if you go on Wikipedia, It'll tell you the Cardinals were born in 1898 as the Morgan Athletic Club. And then the owner was named Chris O'Brien. And he bought jerseys uh, that from the University of Chicago that looked like they were Cardinal Red. That's where the team name came from. And so over the years, uh, I've been perplexed by this. My first book, I noticed that some of this wasn't true. And then this uh, last book I wrote on the Bears and the Cardinals, I kind of explained where all this misinformation came from. 
And, and there's one that says the Cardinals didn't exist for a period of time, uh, from, oh, say, 1913 to 1918 or something. But what this document says uh, is that the Cardinals incorporated, and when I say the Cardinals, Chris O'Brien was not the owner. He was a player in 1899 when the team started as Morgan Athletic Association, and they got their name, the Cardinals, by naming themselves the Cardinals Social and Athletic Club in 1901. And Chris O'Brien kept the team going then for the next couple of decades and then finally incorporated the team as the Racing Cardinals Pleasure Club. And I can't make that name up, Darren, but that was the name, the Pleasure <laughs> Club. Doesn't sound like a football team. I don't know what it sounds like. It sounds There's like the documents. places that my mother told me to stay out of when I was a stay young man. way, young Darren, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was... Uh, uh, Got a copy of this from the Pro Football Hall of Fame years ago and was able to make a, a copy of it. So that's not the original, but no one knows that outside this household or you and the millions of listeners. Uh, <laughs> it's a copy. Uh, it looks perfect. It, it put it on some rough old paper. Uh, so it's one of my neatest possessions, although it's not the original. That's at the Pro Football Hall of Fame. But it does prove that the Cardinals existed in 1917, I think, when this thing, uh, when they did incorporate, and the team was still going strong at the time. So uh, I love that piece. Darren, I wish it was the original. Uh, you and I can go on a worldwide cruise if we sold it, but uh, <laughs> it's there at the Hall of Fame. Well, I think the uh, entire Bidwell family is a sigh, having a sigh of relief that you don't have the the papers for their franchise, uh, the originals. It's it's a copy, so you can yeah. you can rest assured. Uh, now, this last item that you shared, this is uh, an extremely personal one to you, and I know this is uh, inspirational. And you've you've chatted about it. I've read it in your books, and uh, and uh, maybe you could talk about that. Yeah, I, I, you were kind enough to let me talk about this uh, a while back, but what this is, I believe, is the letter from Coach Jimmy Councilman to my father, inviting him or telling him to report to the Cardinals training camp back in 1940. And what's so interesting about this is that my dad was a great football player at a little place called St. Benedict's in Kansas. He was an All-American. He was big for the time, 6'4", 235, and end. And uh, St. Benedict's played a big time schedule. We didn't have the different divisions of the NCAA at the time, but they would play New Mexico State and Creighton uh, were some of the clubs that they played against. And he was drafted by the Cardinals in 1940. And so this letter is, is interesting, and I didn't really know it existed for most of my adult life. He had passed away in the 70s, and stuff of his was in boxes, and we moved those every time we change locations and residences until I finally looked at it, maybe like the early 90s, and saw this letter from Councilman, and with it was his contract with the Cardinals. But one of the interesting things about the letter, first of all, it got me going on my research. I wanted to find out what happened to him, uh, why he didn't play with the Cardinals. But the letter talks a lot about early pro football because it says in a PS at the bottom, looking forward to training camp opening in August to be there, be in shape, et cetera, et cetera. Please bring your own shoes and shoulder pads. And that was the <laughs> NFL in 1940. And then his, his contract was unique as well, which I also have on display is he, his contract was for $110 a game. They didn't get paid apparently if they were hurt. And so he was injured in training camp. And while he was in the little company of Mary Hospital on 111th, or excuse me, 95th Street, uh, right outside Chicago in Evergreen Park, he decided that he could make more money accepting a job to coach high school football than he could playing professional football. And so we have concluded the draft by the time uh, we're on the air with this. We see some of the contracts then, but 1940, $110 a game. Uh, and that was what, what they made. So I think he probably made the right decision, but it started my uh, research instincts going and prompted my first book to find out what happened to him. And I found there was really no history on the Cardinals. And as we alluded to a little while ago, a lot of the history of the Cardinals was inaccurate. So we were able to find out as well. But I was happy because I got to know a lot of the players uh, throughout the years from those 40s teams. And they had a reunion in 1997 of the 50th anniversary of the NFL title. And one of the players was Billy Duell, uh, all pro end. 
And I had been in touch with a lot of the guys before, and I introduced myself to him. And he specifically remembered my dad. He described him at the training camp. And he said, yeah, your dad would have been a big help to us back then. I thought, wow, okay, my search is complete. And then I found a magazine. Again, we talk about collectibles. Uh, I was picking up anything I could from the 40s and found a magazine uh, which listed the highlights of the season, the schedule, and a little like two page spread of all the teams. And my dad was mentioned as one of the 32 guys apparently who made the team and he didn't pursue it because that knee injury, which would have probably been a simple arthroscopic surgery today, but instead walked away from pro football. But the conclusion of his story in football, at least pro football started mind. When I saw this stuff, I said, I got to find out more about these guys. And now Darren, as you and I probably know, it gets pretty addictive when we do our research of early pro football. Absolutely. I mean, this um, letter, now, you know, just you telling me that. And when I read it and knowing, knowing you know, a little bit about your story and your father, you know, this is, uh, I knew it was pretty significant to, to starting your career as being a historian and a writer and, uh, you know, going on this path, collecting. And, and your father was a big influence in your life, as, as most fathers are to their sons. But I find it you know, so otherwise symbolic because, uh, you know, Mr. Konzelman is telling your dad to, pre- to come and prepare, like you said, bring your shoes and shoulder pads. And the training camp is at, I believe, the same school where your dad ended up coaching and teaching at. Is that true? Is it Morgan Park? (laughs) Boy, you caught that one, Darren. Yes. The training camp was at Morgan Park Military Academy on 111th Street. And my dad spent a great deal of his career there. We lived on the campus. It was a boarding school for kids, a military school and uh, a a huge donation or or I guess a contribution to World War II efforts from the cadets there. And, but yeah, he was there. And of course I'm a little self promotion here. Uh, Another book I wrote was on the great football program at Morgan park military Academy. How even now they haven't had football for 45 years, I think are still among the top wins all time uh, in the state of Illinois for a high school. And so he coached there, had some great teams and the Cardinals came back, I think in the late thirties, early forties and trained there because they could get the whole campus that had cafeterias and beds and put the whole team up for, I think two two dollars and fifty cents a day per man. So it was a, it was a good deal. But yeah, good catch, Darren. Thank you very much. Yeah, your your father didn't realize that he was the training camp was going to be uh, extend for decades that he would be at that, <laughs> that right. field. So that's right. <laughs> so, so, yeah, great great stuff. And uh, you know, folks, you know, like Joe says, he's got multiple books out there. You go on Amazon. I believe the majority of your books are are still live on Amazon. If uh, yeah. So yeah, so you search on Joe's name, Joe Ziemba, and it should pop right up, and you'll see all the writings by the the great historian and author Joe Ziemba. Who you hear how he tells a story? He does it with a pen as well, and uh, or typewriter, I guess, and uh, <laughs> does a great job there. And I think you'll really enjoy it and learn a lot about football history. So, Joe, we've learned a lot today, and boy, we thank you for sharing and coming on and and sharing these images of your collection with us on the website. And uh, really, thank you for coming today. Well, you are too kind, Darren, and, and thank you for risking all by having me again. And I really do appreciate it. Thank you very much. We're taking a peek over at the chains in the down marker. It's fourth and long. We're going to have to punt the ball and get on out of here, but we'll have another series tomorrow for your football history headlines, so be sure to tune in. We invite you to check out our website, pigskindispatch.com, not only to see the daily football history, but to experience positive football with our many articles on the good people of the game, as well as our own football comic strip, Cleat Marks Comics. Pigskindispatch.com is also on social media outlets, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and don't forget the Pigskin Dispatch YouTube channel to get all of your positive football news and history. Special thanks to the talents of Mike and Gene Monroe, as well as Jason Neff for letting us use their music during our podcast. Pigskindispatch.com is a proud affiliate of the Sports History Network, the headquarters of Sports Yesteryear. Hey there, Sports History fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude, and I wanted to thank you for stopping by to listen to another episode here on the Sports History Network. Our podcasters are passionate about uncovering and sharing sports stories from yesteryear. And if you didn't know it already, we have over 30 shows across the network covering all sorts of sports history topics. In fact, here's a glimpse into one of our awesome podcasts here on the network. 
Each week, the official Football Learning Academy podcast will take you deep into the history of pro football through interviews with players, coaches, or administrators in the NFL, as well as interviews with Pro Football Hall of Fame selectors, authors, and historians. You'll learn how the game evolved and important moments that shaped the sport into what it is today. And don't miss the Pro Football History Nugget of the Week. Listen to the official Football Learning Academy podcast on the Sports History Network. How about that? I bet you're super hyped to go listen to that new podcast, right? Well, to learn about this show and all the other podcasts on the network, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash podcast. Again, that's sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash podcast. Head over there today to find your next favorite sports history podcast.